This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 379, recorded on March 4th, 2016. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. How are you today? Great. It's 32 degrees, which we know is zero Celsius, and it's sunny. We did have some snow last night, so that was our second storm in March. And uh, we're thinking maybe no more. We uh, (laughs) Yeah, we had snow last night as well just like less than an inch yeah it is currently two degrees celsius here we got partially cloudy skies supposed to get some more snow maybe sunday it's it's a nice winter day winter is still here uh in the northeast also joining us from north central florida rich condit howdy everybody how have you Uh, been i'm just uh just i couldn't possibly be better i mean <laughs> it's unbelievable it's really good so uh i you know i'm really amazed this is i often re- think about the degree spread between north and south this is extreme it's 72 degrees here mm. so kathy that's 40 degrees difference from you can you believe that yeah that's 22 celsius and it's gorgeous Clear blue skies. It's just absolutely gorgeous. What's so the city? Good. What's the city that Lou Band kept saying it's minus seventy or something? Well, let's bring oh. in <laughs> let's bring in someone who might know from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. <laughs> good to be here, and uh, and glad I'm not in Yakutsk, which I think might have been the city that he was yeah, close enough. referring to in Siberia. Did you have some and, snow last night? A uh, couple little flurries. Nothing stuck. Uh, now it's um, it's one Celsius here, and dew points minus seven, and we've got some. Some clouds, a little overcast layer that's supposed to clear out tonight. Mm, very good. Uh, that's all four of you, all three of you. We're going to have Dixon coming in later. And today we have a guest for the second week in a row. He is from Gainesville, Florida, University of Florida, the uh, place where Rich has a uh, professor emeritus appointment. He's a professor in the same department, molecular genetics and microbiology. Scott Tibbetts, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Our pleasure. This is a M-sphere stimulated episode. As uh, as everyone might know, I, I am the I editor at M-sphere, which means I look at the papers and people recommend from time to time papers they think are Twix worthy or worthy of talking about on our podcasts. We've done a couple here on Twiv so far. Is this the third one? I remember Carolyn Coins previously. Anyway, so Scott, your paper was selected. <laughs> yes, you are. Lucky winner. For Twi- you are the lucky winner. So uh, that's cool. This was a paper um, that's been, it just came out Wednesday uh, in, in M Sphere, right? And the editor was uh, Paul Dupre. Correct. Who um, is the guy who, he, I get this every Friday, I get a. Uh, Uh, an Excel spreadsheet, which has all the uh, accepted papers. And there's a column where the editors say whether it's podcast worthy or not. (laughs) It's not something you want to circulate, I guess. So this one had had your your paper, so we're going to talk about today. But before we do that, I just want to tell everyone that this episode of TWIV is sponsored by the 32nd Clinical Virology Symposium which is going to take place in Daytona Beach, Florida, from May 19th through the 22nd. It's not too far off now. And in fact, the uh, abstract deadline is March 17th, 13 days from today as we record. And uh, you can send in your abstract to discuss, to present your work on the following topics, rapid viral diagnosis, the clinical course of virus infection, and ways to prevent and treat infections. There'll be over a thousand people there, including basic scientists and primary care physicians. You can find out more about this 
very short meeting. Actually, it's not 30 seconds, 32, it's 30 seconds long. It is the 30 seconds a year that they've been doing this. And hopefully next year they'll, they'll have us talk about this meeting again and we won't have to make timing jokes. <laughs> Go to asm.org slash cvs2016 for more information. So Scott, where are you from? Originally from the Kansas City, Missouri area. Wow. So Midwest. And um, I know that your wife is also in the department, Stephanie Karst, right? She is. She's from St. Louis, so we're both Midwest transplants. And we had Stephanie on uh, TWIV a while ago now, right? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So did she give you any pointers? Uh, she said you're not on really. Your, she said you're on your own. You're on your own. <laughs> Good luck. Where did you guys meet? In, in grad school? Postdocs? Over a microscope, of course. Over a microscope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we met in our during our postdoc, actually. And we were both in Skip Virgin's lab for mm -hmm. our postdoc. And it was a big enough lab that we worked there for two years before we really knew each other. <laughs> Let me ask but, you, do you wear so, so you were virgins when you met. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I have no comment. <laughs> we, could, we could work that into the title somehow. <laughs> um. So, and you came right from Skip's lab into Gainesville, right? No, uh, actually, uh, when when we first came out, we were looking for two positions. Obviously, right. finding two positions, uh, two virology positions, w was difficult. So we looked looked around quite a bit. We actually, uh, the incomparable Dennis O'Callaghan, who's in at the Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center in Shreveport, Louisiana was uh, recruiting people and he had a couple of positions open at that particular time. And so we went there, we were there for, for five years. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a great place to get started, but uh, the opportunity to move to Florida arose. Um, and so we jumped at that opportunity. And you have to say it must be because you're a little safer from hurricanes there in Gainesville. Right? <laughs> 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 Perhaps. Oh, that's cool. Shreveport's in the north, so we were relatively protected. Oh, okay. So before you went to Skip's lab, yeah. uh, where were you for your PhD? Yeah, so I uh, I did my training at the University of Kansas, actually. That's where I, where I also did my undergrad. Ah. This is in Kansas City, right? It's west of Kansas City a bit, about 60 miles. So it's the, the main campus. So what's in Manhattan, Kansas? What's that? Kansas that is, State? That is the, uh, yeah, Kansas State, exactly. Okay. okay. I visited there last year, my first time to uh, Kansas. I, I landed at, um, I guess I would have landed at near Kansas City, right, at the airport? Probably, yeah. And Kansas, I, you can land anywhere. And <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the speed limit on the highway was like 85 or something like that. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> it's really high. And, so, Scott, did you work on viruses as a graduate student? No, I worked on immunology. So I worked on T cell immunology as a graduate student. See, that's, Ooh, that's, that's cool. That's why there's immunology in this paper, flow cytometry. A right. <laughs> little bit, yeah. So you and so did you did you go to Skiss Lab to specifically to work on viruses? Yeah, I, I I got I'm I I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I always had kind of a side interest in viruses and it was one of those situations where, uh, you know, when I was in graduate school, I had to write a qualifying exam and you have to do it on something that's not your topic. And so I, I did it on uh, gamma herpes virus, a newly discovered gamma herpes virus, KSHV. And uh, I got really fascinated in it. And in the course of that, decided that's, that's the kind of thing I wanted to work on for my postdoc. And so that's why I went to St. Louis. And actually, when I went to St. Louis, it was because of Sam Speck. Um, who is an Epstein-Barr virus person at the time. And uh, so I went and interviewed with him. And at the time, uh, he and Skip Virgin were running sort of a, a joint laboratory operation where they were working on this new mouse gamma herpes virus. And so that was, that was what brought me there. Mm. Then you brought that to uh, Florida with you, right? That's correct. So our paper today is all about uh, this mouse gamma herpes virus number 68 and i thought maybe you could tell us just a bit who do we know who discovered this virus and why it's 68 are there 67 others <laughs> there are there are at least at least 76 others <laughs> uh yeah it was discovered in in basically in eastern europe in uh. in 1980 and and 
not much was done with it for quite a long time. Um, so it was discovered in mouse in mice, I presume, right? It was actually discovered initially in a, a rodent population that's called bank voles. Ah, right. Right. So those are kind of like mice. Yeah. yeah. A bit. But then it was later found to be uh, endemic in, in some mouse populations in the wild in Eastern Europe as well as the, the UK. And I'm guessing bank voles are found along rivers and not in safe deposit boxes. As far as I know. Okay. <laughs> Maybe there's some in there too. Yes. You never know. I'm I'm never going to the bank again. <laughs> uh, you want to just give me your money? No, oh no, <laughs> not doing that. A small animal with red brown fur and gray patches. Do we know, uh, Scott? Does the 68 do anything bad to a bank vole? Uh, it does not. It's asymptomatic. It's actually yeah. people have tried to to infect bank voles in the laboratory. It actually doesn't inf- infect bank voles very easily yeah. so it's believed that the the primary reservoir is the yellow necked mouse <laughs> the yellow i love these names <laughs> yes. and so so do a lot of yellow necked mice have this thing yes yes definitely and it, does it, it do anything to them no asymptomatic okay. why, why do we call it murine gamma herpes virus 68 if it came from a bank vole uh, that that is a good question. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> is it right? So let let me ask you this: Who was the first to start putting this in mice and deciding it was a good model to study gamma herpes viruses? Well, there were several groups, um, particularly uh, groups in in the UK. Uh, mm-hmm. Tony Nash's group, uh, in particular, started doing doing some of this work early okay. on, where they were inf- infecting mice and and could show that it could infect B cells, um, and and had some. Uh, it was reminiscent of human gamma herpes virus infections. Mm-hmm. And so in 1997, 96, 97, uh, Skip and Sam's lab sort of got together and decided that that might be a really interesting model to study. And so they they basically used the, the sequencing apparatus at Washington University School of Medicine, which is where they were located, um, to, to sequence the whole virus. At the time, that was a, a big deal. Um, so they sequenced the whole virus and found that it had a lot of similarity to the human gamma herpes viruses. And so from that point on, began to to study that in a lot more detail. Got it. And in terms of in terms of the physiology of the infection in the in the mouse, uh, how closely does it resemble uh, a human gamma herpes virus? Uh, very reminiscent in in a lot of aspects. Um, in in that. It uh, recapitulates infection in so the the acute stage of infection, which may last for a couple of weeks, uh, occurs in in multiple organs and multiple cell types. But then after you you have an immune response, of course, um, once your immune response shuts that down, the, these viruses establish lifelong latency in in restricted cell populations. And in, in this case, it was B cells, uh, which is basically the same thing as what happens with the human viruses, Epstein-Barr virus and, and Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus. So this I really love. With a, So what you have is an animal model that very closely resembles the human disease where you have a, 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 a homologous virus. I mean, this virus came from this uh, species of host uh, or, or close. Yes. I mean, um, uh, does it do anything symptomatically to laboratory mice? No, it doesn't. And 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 actually, I think that's a good thing because that essentially re- recapitulates what happens with gamma herpes virus infections of humans, which is if you have a normal functional immune system, you get infected with these viruses and it's typically very asymptomatic. Um, and that's exactly what happens with the laboratory mouse. So in, in, when it goes latent in these mice... So you have a period of acute virus production, then it becomes latent. Um, are, are there periodic reactivations as there are with, with the human gammas? Uh, yes, presumably. Those are obviously really, because it's at a very low level and yeah. because you have an immune system that, that shuts it down, um, those, it's, it's actually quite hard to detect reactivation events. Mm. But, but we presume that there's ongoing reactivation and that's probably how these viruses spread from person to person. Mm. So on some occasions uh, with the human gamma herpes viruses, they've been, they can be associated with certain diseases, notably lymphomas and stuff. Is that this, uh, 
do you get, can you get that kind of thing with uh, MHV 68? Yeah, absolutely. And so with, with humans, as you know, these viruses can cause tumors and lymphoproliferative diseases in humans with normal immune systems, but the prevalence of the diseases go up immensely in people that are immunocompromised. And so um, with mice, it's the same. If we infected enough mice, I'm sure that we would see some level of disease. But if we infect mice that are deficient in particular immune components, we can see uh, a, a real prevalence of disease. And so if you infect, for instance, CD8 deficient mice, CD8 T cell deficient mice, then you know upwards of, of 40% of the mice can develop lymphoproliferative disease and a, a B cell lymphoma. Has anybody ever done the experiment of infecting a whole slug uh, collection of recombinant inbred mice with different backgrounds to see what happens, see if they can find uh, a particular mouse that shows a particular syndrome? Uh, as far as tumor genesis, I don't know that anybody's done that. Uh, okay. And the, pr- the problem with that, like the human viruses, you know, you can get infected with EBV when you're a child and not develop a tumor until you're 70 years old because right. you, have, you have these for life, right? So with mice, it's the same. Their lifespan may be a lot shorter, but we have, we have to wait a year before we can see the development of a tumor. Right. Um, and so those kinds of experiments would be excruciatingly financially painful <laughs> right <laughs> is this is this a bank full that somebody yeah. pays it into the oh well, he's a cute little sucker yeah very yeah, cute, that's great. Very cute. <laughs> that looks like a that looks like a show image it's very cute yeah what's he chewing well, and, oh, and bank foals might have the money for a big study he's, uh, he's chewing on an acorn look at looks the size like it of to that me, yeah yeah it's right. just it's the top hit in google images <laughs> tiny little guy it's not much bigger than an acorn you acorn you bead I dare you to know what that's from. Um, uh, got me. Yeah, uh-huh. it's okay. I was making an appointment the other day, and and the lady said, "How about March fifteenth? And I said, "Oh, the Ides of March." And she said, "What?" <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> anyway, the title of the paper is "A Gamma Herpes Virus Non-Coding RNA Is Essential for Hematogenous Dissemination and Establishment of Peripheral Latency." And the first author is Emily Feldman, and the other authors are Kara Oko Grau, Kruger, Zhang, Feng, Van Dyke, Ren, and Tibbetts, that be you. And maybe you could give us the backstory on uh, on this paper. Yeah, so the backstory really is, starts when I when I got to Florida. Um, I was interested in, in starting up some new projects when I came to Florida, and as it turns out, uh, Rolf Rennie, who is, uh, he studies KSHV microRNAs and, and other kinds of non-coding RNAs, was here. And then Dave Bloom, uh, who works on herpes simplex virus, non-coding RNAs, was here. And so uh, Florida, Rich will tell you, is a, a phenomenal place to be for the, the quality of the science and the quality of people that are here. And people are very willing to collaborate. And so we initiated some collaborations very early on with those guys looking at non-coding and RNAs and these viruses. And, and the ones that, that we, we started with were uh, microRNAs. And so, you know, I, I always, when I give talks, I talk about how if you, if you search on Google and look for images of types of RNAs, you're going to a lot of time come up with study guides that say there's three kinds of RNA, ribosomal, tRNA, and messenger <laughs> RNA. And, and of course, what we know now is that's really just the tip of the iceberg. And so 15 years ago or so, people started to discover micro RNAs, which are these small RNAs that, that regulate uh, translation. Um, but since then, we've discovered you know many different classes of small regulatory RNAs and long non-coding RNAs. Uh, and so, in host cells, there are thousands, maybe tens of thousands, of these kinds of regulatory RNAs. And for the most part, we don't know what most of them do. And I think it's not surprising to think about the the fact that viruses have have adopted some of these RNAs for their use. And of course, herpes viruses, because they're big double-stranded DNA viruses, are are prime candidates for for using some of these RNAs. Um, And and 
the gamma herpes, the human gamma herpes viruses express uh, multiple microRNAs, and people have done lots of studies, including Rolf Rennie's lab, have done lots of studies with these viruses, looking at the microRNAs and trying to figure out which messenger RNAs in a cell they target. And, and you can validate those targets and show that a particular microRNA blocks translation of a particular protein. But in general, that's all within a cell in vitro. And, and the question is, and the question that we had is, is, what is the function of these RNAs in vivo? And so that's sort of where we were at when we started this project. Um, and with, with this particular virus, the virus that we use to do these in vivo studies, MHV, MHV68, um, there are 14 of these pre-micro RNAs in the virus. And, and really, to that point, we had no idea what they did. Um, and so Emily Feldman was a new student in my lab, and she took on what was really a pretty risky project of trying to figure out what these things do. And, you know, maybe they didn't, didn't do anything at all, but we don't know until we, until we try, right? <laughs> yeah, that'd be a tough one. No function. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. It, well, that's kind of, that's kind of where, it, what the result was in the beginning, right? I mean, I yeah. recall talks from Emily where she says, we did all this stuff and nothing's happening. <laughs> Yes, thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> Good times, yes, exactly. So we, I mean, we felt, we hypothesized that these non-coding RNAs were probably important in latency and in pathogenesis because we knew all along from studies many years ago in, in Stacey Estafi's lab that these RNAs, the precursors to the microRNAs, were expressed in latently infected cells in vivo. And they were expressed, we, sh we showed later uh, in Skip's lab, in, in that these RNAs were expressed in tumors or during, the, during the process of tumorigenesis. And, and so we, we felt like they may have some role. And so we went in and started knocking knocking some of these out. Um, and the, the thing that's rich, rich is referring to is, you know, how, how do you think about this problem when you have 14 potential coding regions, how do you deal with that problem? Well, we thought we'd go in and knock out individual non-coding RNA regions and, and ask whether it has an effect, but maybe the effect would be subtle. And so what we did instead was to go in and knock out all of them at the same time, and then ask whether that had an effect in vivo. And Emily's early work on this showed that if we knocked all of those non-coding RNAs out, we had normal replication of the virus during the early stage of infection. And we had a bit of a phenotype during latency. That is, the virus normally established late latency in B cells. You can take out the spleen and, and as, a, as a good source of B cells uh, and ask how many of those cells carry the virus. In the case of wild type virus, it carried like one in 250 of the, B, of the cells in the spleen carried the virus. If we deleted all of these non-coding RNAs at the same time, uh, that went down to one in 600. So that was a, like a two and a half fold defect, which was honestly quite disappointing. <laughs> Uh, so that's that's what Rich is referring to, and and so those were you know we got results with that, and you know we could talk about it later, but we did we were able to show that if we knocked all of them out, we got a really good, uh, an incredibly striking result in pathogenesis, but in the latency assays, we really had a very subtle phenotype, and so that was that was rather disappointing. Before we go on, let me welcome Dixon De Palmier. Hi everybody. Hi, Dixon. Hey, Rich. <laughs> At least someone's happy to see you. Right. Right. I've been listening. I've been listening. For how long? Uh, at least uh, the last six minutes. Oh, I thought you've been here for hours, and days, well, weeks. Trust me, I read the paper, but I'm not sure I understood everything well, you read. That's, that's what we have Scott here for. Exactly right. And you can ask questions. Did you know that, Dixon? Well, I did know that, actually. Okay, good. So what what uh, what's in this paper that's different, Scott? Well, so... You know, we had this very subtle latency phenotype with this mutant that we call the combinatorial mutant. Um, but while Emily was doing all that in vivo work with the combinatorial mutant, she was making all of the individual mutant viruses, viruses which carry mutations in individual mm -hmm. 
microRNA precursors. And so she had made a whole entire panel of these mutants, and, and we figured we'd get a big latency phenotype, and then we'd follow up that big latency phenotype with testing all these individual <laughs> mutants and asking what they did and solving the problem, right? But uh, of, of course, that wasn't where, what we had at that point. But we still had this big panel of viruses, and we thought, you know, we, ha we have to test these and see if anything looks interesting. Mm. And so in this particular paper, the foundation of this paper is that Emily tested all of these mutants. And as you would expect, most of the mutants looked exactly like wild types. So they had no phenotype whatsoever. Some of them had intermediate phenotypes between wild type and the combinatorial mutant, except for one. There was one mutant, the, the mutant in the non-coding RNA that we call TMR4, uh, that had an enormous attenuation in latency establishment. So instead of getting one in 250 cells carrying viral genome, that dropped down to one in 6,500 cells. And that's a 26-fold defect, which in this particular system is, is an enormous phenotype. So here's weirdness number one, right? Right. <laughs> the knocking all of them out doesn't do anything, including this. That's included in the knockout. Right. But knocking one out does something. So exactly. How do, you, how do you think about that? Yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard question, right? Because th the thing to keep in mind here is this is exactly the same mutation as the one in the combinatorial mutant. Mm -hmm. So how how do you explain that? Well, Emily brought me the data, and when she brought me the data, I thought this can't be real. Like there's something wrong with the virus, right? So Emily went in and she she repeated it multiple times, and we got the same result. And so being a, a proper herpes virologist, I said, well, you have to make another one. So she went and made another one. It had the same phenotype. And then the other thing we had, we needed to do was make a revertin. So we put the wild type sequence back in and it, and it had a normal, it had a normal phenotype indicating that it was in fact this team or four that was responsible for the phenotype. And so I like you have that to, formal genetics. Exactly. Like that. Yeah. yeah. You have to. You know, in the old days, we called that marker rescue. Yes, exactly. I don't know if you still do that, but that's... Exactly. What, yeah. Rescue virus. So, you know, the question now is, what is that thing doing? And why do you have a phenotype with one when you didn't have a phenotype with all the rest? And, and I think the most likely explanation is that TMR4 probably does something to counteract deleterious consequences of all the other tumors. And that's a little bit hard to, to think about in some ways, but I, I think a, a classic example of this kind of thing is, is human papillomavirus, which has, it needs to, uh, when it infects cells, it needs to drive the cell cycle. The way it does that is to drive uh, the cell cycle through uh, sequestering RB using its E7 protein, right? So the, that's great. It gets the cell moving and all the machinery moving, but the, the negative consequence of that action is that it stimulates the P53 pathway, which should cause apoptosis of the cell. And so E7 is doing something important, but the virus has a protein E6, which can counteract that and block apoptosis. And so if you took both of those out, you wouldn't see anything at all. If you took E6 out, E7 would cause the cell cycle to move, but it would also cause apoptosis. And so we're kind of thinking about it in that way, and that perhaps TMR4 blocks something negative that all the other TMRs induce. Hmm. Right. So a logical experiment would be to do TMR4 in double mutants with all of the other individual guys. Yes, exactly. Yeah, to figure out which ones are doing it. Is it all of them? It's probably one or two of them that are doing something important somewhere in some site in the mouse, but because they're all expressed all the time, it's turning on some, say, negative pathways like induction of apoptosis, mm -hmm. and TMR4 may be blocking that deleterious consequence. So you also looked at the kinds of B cells that are involved in... in these infections, is that right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we did some of this where we, we, we several years ago, Mike Neely, my lab, made a, a marker virus in which we fused a, a beta-lactamase gene um, to uh, one of the important latency genes. 
so that we could pick up using flow cytometry, we could pick out latently infected cells and we could from from in vivo samples and, and figure out which cell types are carrying the virus at particular times. And so uh, we've looked at in, in these infections, we've looked at in individual B cell subsets that are infected. And we know uh, through a lot of previous work, we know that naive B cells and germinal center B cells and memory B cells are all infected. This is very reminiscent of what happens with Epstein-Barr virus. Mm -hmm. um, and the the paradigm, at least, with, with both of these viruses is that the virus infects naive B cells and then drives independent of antigen drives those B cells to go through germinal center reactions and differentiate into the memory B cell compartment. And, and what we've seen with, with this particular virus, when we look at those individual populations of cells, we see that the mutant virus uh, has sort of an increased level of naive and germinal center B cells, but a decreased level of, of memory B cell infection, um, and, which may suggest that this tumor is, uh, this non-coding RNA is helping the virus drive those cells from the naive compartment into the memory compartment. Mm -hmm. And that's probably an interesting question. At some point, you want to identify the target of this microRNA, and then it may be in the B cell uh, induction pathway, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's a whole, that's a whole separate avenue in and of itself, but that's definitely a, a, an interesting finding. Yeah. It's also this uh, virus also had a, a a lethality phenotype, right? Yeah, exactly. So this sort of gets back to to Rich's Condit, Rich Condit's question from earlier about if if you infect different mice on different backgrounds, do you get different disease states? And that's certainly the case with these viruses. If you infect mice that are deficient in CD8 T cells, you may develop lymphoma or lymphoproliferative disease. If you infect mice that are deficient in uh, different interferon components or other signaling molecules, you may end up with different kinds of disease states. In this case, uh, Linda Van Dyke, who's at the University of Colorado and who is a collaborator, uh, had discovered a few years ago the fact that these viruses, when you, when you infect uh, balb mice that are deficient in interferon gamma, uh, the, the mice succumb to, about 80% of the mice succumb to a non-bacterial pneumonia. And, uh, and, and that occurs within a couple of weeks. And so she's used that model in, in multiple cases. And so we collaborated with her on this. And she, she uh, Lauren Oko in her lab, tested the viruses out and found that the mutant virus like the combinatorial mutant virus, was completely attenuated uh, for mm -hmm. lethality in the system. So not only does the, this mutant contribute to latency establishment, but also to uh, the disease pathogenesis. So both the combinatorial mutant and the TMR4 mutant uh, are, uh, uh, have a phenotype in that model. That is, they don't cause the disease, right? Yeah, have a have a very striking phenotype, and that's it, that's complicated because there are the the pneumonia pathogenesis we do not understand completely, and it's multi it's certainly multifactorial, so it, it, we can't make specific conclusions about that yet. I think. How about the other individual team or knockouts in that model? In that model, not many of them have been tested. Um, Linda has some really interesting data uh, actually showing that the t if she takes a, a total mutant virus um, and puts back one of the tRNAs, actually, the we, ha we haven't talked about that in a lot of detail yet. but Yeah, we need to. Um, but the, the tRNA portion of these tumors, if she puts one of those back, the tRNA from tumor one, uh, it, it restores some of, the, some of the lethality. And so suggesting that, that that contributes in some way to this. So that's the next thing we, your paper deals with, the, the different parts within tumor four. Why don't you explain that to us? Yeah, exactly. So the the thing that we haven't really talked about yet is that each of these non-coding RNA elements uh, not only encodes microRNAs, um, but also in and of itself, the transcript in and of itself is a non-coding RNA. And so, um, whereas a lot of 
microRNAs are part of a, a larger transcript dri- driven by polymerase two. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this virus, each of these transcripts, there's eight of these Tamer transcripts um, that are driven by polymerase three promoters, and each of these Tamer transcripts has essentially three different elements. At the beginning of it, uh, at the five prime end of it, is a tRNA-like element. Um, followed by a microRNA stem loop, a pre-microRNA stem loop, uh, followed by another pre-microRNA stem loop. And so every one of these eight teamers has this particular structure, and each of them is a, is a polymerase three transcript. Why is it called tRNA-like? Because it looks like one? Yeah, so it, 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 it in silico, at least, mm. uh, by modeling, looks like one. Um, Stacey Asafi's group showed many years ago that that these could be processed normally and they could be uh, matured normally in a host cell. That is, they could be uh, the the three prime CCA edition, hmm. which is indicative of a of a functional tRNA. Um, but the, they the tRNAs normally what would happen is a host tRNA would be amino isolated, so it would mm-hmm. be linked to the requisite um, amino acid. And so these tRNA-like elements apparently are, are not charged. They don't actually mm. uh, get linked to their, their cognate amino acids. Do we know, Do you know if they have the, any of those odd base modifications that tRNAs get? The, um, in the, you mean in the anticodon region? Um, just yeah, I can't remember exactly where they are. I just they're scattered. They're scattered, scattered all over. Scattered the place. throughout. Scattered, yeah, yeah. uracil yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, we haven't looked at that extensively yet. To be honest, they there there is a lot of conservation in um, essentially the outer. If you think about a tRNA shape that has that clover leaf shape, the middle. The middle portion of it is the anticodon, and that's the most variable region, and that's the case with with all of these. The outer leaves of the clover leaf are um, actually really highly conserved between the teamers, and they're conserved with regard to host tRNAs as well. And so it's really that that middle leaf uh, where the the variability occurs. So you found that it's in fact this tRNA part that mediating this phenotype, right? Well, we think it's actually the whole entire thing. And mm-hmm. so um, what we did after we, we had this, this really interesting phenotype in our, in our latency assays in vivo was we, Emily went back in and then started making mutations of the microRNA regions and of those pre-microRNA hairpins. And so, of course, we hypothesized we had the, the mutant that we had been studying to this point expressed the tRNA normally, um, but did not have either of the microRNA stem loops. And so, what Emily did was to go back in and uh, make mutants that carried, say, the tRNA plus the first stem loop or the tRNA plus the second stem loop. The thought was that there's, there's one microRNA within this element that is responsible for this phenotype and we'll make a bunch of mutants and we'll figure out which microRNA is responsible for the phenotype. And, and so essentially she made uh, six new mutants um, where she knocked out either individual stem loops uh, or even when she was keeping a stem loop would knock out the microRNA seed sequence, which targets the microRNA to its transcript uh, within the remaining stem loop. And, and, Obviously, we knew when we got this done, we were going to figure out which microRNA it was. And so, as my, as my friend Craig Forrest likes to say, biology does not care about your hypothesis. It's <laughs> yes. a good uh, one. Nature in general. Yes. Indeed. I'm sure he stole that from somebody else. But um, it, when Emily took all these mutants and infected mice, took the spleens out, did the limiting dilution PCR assay to look for the presence of the virus in B cells and found that all of the mutants behaved exactly like wild type virus. So they had no phenotype whatsoever. The, the only one that gave us that really strong phenotype was the mutant that was deleted in both of those pre-micro RNA stem loops. Mm. 
And so the, con the conclusion from that, I guess the, con the two conclusions that we could make, one was that um, the, I think that definitively showed that, that the micro RNAs themselves had n no impact. They were completely dispensable for the wild type function of this non-coding RNA. Um, the other thing that we can conclude from that is that the TMR4, the tRNA element alone was not sufficient to mm -hmm. convey normal wild type function. And so what we think probably uh, is that you need, in order to get wild type function of this non-coding RNA, is that you need this tRNA-like element plus some other bit of sequence and maybe in fact one of the other stem loops but in a sequence non-specific manner. So what is, what is happening to these sequences? So are the, the, the microRNA stem loops, are they eventually being processed to a, a microRNA? And then what's happening to the tRNA? Yeah, exactly. So um, it depends on the tumor, first of all. Mm. But um, so Brian Cullen showed several years ago uh, that the, once the, the tumor was expressed, uh, in, in full length, it could be processed by tRNA Z, which is a normal host tRNA processing enzyme. Um, that would cleave the structure into the pre microRNA stem loops. And then that bit would be exported to the cytoplasm where it would be presumably processed by Dicer into mature microRNAs. Mm. So the tRNA is, is remaining, but nobody knows what it's doing. And, yeah. and and for years, people thought that these are sort of useless transcripts, hmm. even though even though we knew that they were expressed in basically all late lane infected cells. Nobody knew what they actually did. So we don't really know what the tRNA portion is doing. It may be contributing to processing, or it may have a target even of its own. Maybe absolutely, hmm. absolutely. And in the, in this case we know that you need some other bit of sequence for the function of TMR4. Hmm. But the only thing that, that you can really conclude is that because that sequence, we've shown that it, it can be either of the stem loops convey wild type activity. So we yeah. think because of that, we think that the tRNA itself may be the thing that is conferring specificity of the non-coding RNA mm -hmm. and that you may need that other bit of sequence just for structural, for pulling in other proteins or whatever. Is this also tRNA-like structures? They're also part of cellular microRNA precursors? Uh, in some cases that has been shown, but that's that's very atypical. Yeah. Oh. Very atypical. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. But, you know, we we've when we started going back and looking at northern blots for the processed forms of these non-coding RNAs and TMR4 in particular, what we found is, you know, you can detect the, the processed forms. You can detect full length form of, T of all these TMRs, the full length form. Um, in some cases, you can detect the, an intermediate form. And then in all cases, you can detect the, the tRNA, the processed tRNA itself. And in the case of TMR4, we would expect to detect a lot of the full-length TR teamer, but instead we we detected a, uh, a, a an, an RNA of about 140 nucleotides, which is uh, almost exactly the size of what you would expect for the tRNA-like element plus one stem loop. Hmm. And so that species of RNA is probably present in infected cells. But, you know, we have to figure out what it does. Yeah. But the, the one thing that, that, that really has become interesting about this is that uh, there are other viruses that express these kinds of non-coding RNAs. Um, and so Epstein-Barr virus expresses two RNAs, Eber-1 and Eber-2, which were discovered many, many years ago by Joan Stites. Um, mm -hmm. These are 167 and 172 nucleotide uh, RNAs, they're non-coding, they are polymerase three driven, and they express microRNAs. This is very similar to adenovirus, which has VA1 and VA2 RNAs, which are about 160 nucleotides, polymerase three driven, they express microRNAs. The thing that's in common between all of these is that all of these transcripts are expressed at pretty high levels. Um, and in the case of ABV and MHV68, these transcripts are expressed in all late, almost all latently infected cells and in tumor cells. 
And so we think this may be a, a class of, of we, what we call polyfunctional uh, Longish, we call them longish non-coding RNAs. <laughs> the, a long, the, the arbitrary cutoff for a long non-coding RNA is is 200 nucleotides, and so TMR4 starts as over 200 nucleotides and then gets processed to probably 140. So in the is, lab, in the lab, we call it a longish. Right. Is there any value to uh, radio labeling this and seeing where it might end up in the cell? Yeah, absolutely. We've done some of those experiments with uh, immunofluorescence, for instance, RNA. Uh, in situ hybridization and and with with this transcript we found that uh, it is it, we think uh, nuclear primarily nuclear. Uh, yeah and that's very similar to to the EBV Eber uh -huh. um, which is which is strictly nuclear so yeah it's it's very interesting and it may imply different functions than than something that would be cytoplasmic mm -hmm. uh, we've lost Rich let me try and get him back here. So in the nuclear distribution of your labeled RNA, did it show any particular pattern that might be hinting at something? Not not yet. It does at least so we've seen so far, there's no particular pattern that gives us any strong clues about what's going on. Right. So this is a big at this point, this is a big open open yeah. project yeah. trying to figure out what it does. Right. Is there a way to stick on an anti nuclear transfer? segment onto the RNA to make sure it doesn't get into the nucleus to make sure it's not doing something somewhere else? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure we could figure out a way to do that, but yeah, that would be interesting. It's often hard to stop nuclear proliferation. Um, <laughs> only if you've signed the treaty. <laughs> but So this this seems like it's it's a fairly broadly distributed mechanism that viruses use, it's just very difficult for us to probe because in a lot of these cases, it's going to be doing things in the natural host, which we don't have a good model for. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's the thing that we didn't say early on, the, the gamma herpes viruses, the ones that we're interested in studying, Epstein-Barr virus and Kaposi's sarcoma associated herpes virus are both human viruses. And these viruses are very species specific. And so you can't just take the virus and infect a, a normal mouse and expect to see anything. So that's right. why, that's the beauty of using a, a natural model, uh, a natural pathogen of rodents uh, to be able to study the different aspects of infection. Well, and a natural pathogen that is, that is shockingly similar to the human diseases that you're interested in. Yes, exactly. So what, exactly. If, what if you repaired uh, the tRNA portion of it to actually combine with an amino acid? What do you think you would get with that? I have no idea. <laughs> I assume. I mean, I, I assume that this is functioning as a non-coding RNA. That you, right. would, you would, it, it would be like making a knockout, right? If you, um, if you reassign its function, probably the same phenotype that they got, which is if you just take out the yeah. tRNA, that's yeah. a problem, right? Right. Exactly. I mean, when I first saw your paper, I was thinking of airport designs rather than RNA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It does look like an airport. It's very, right. very similar. <laughs> Exactly. Huh. So uh, um, I dropped out for a minute. So pardon me if you've already covered this, but these tumors are pretty special in structure and synthesis. Uh, are these unique to the uh, MHV68 or are these mouse gamma herpes viruses or do you find tumor like structures elsewhere? Uh, we did already cover that, but. Um, Condit. I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys are at That's the same right. place already. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had internet issues for a second. <laughs> That's all right. EBV, EBV has has these Eber non coding RNAs, which which like these tumors are expressed in lately infected cells and in in almost all tumors. And so, there's do they have a tRNA like structure? And they do. They do. They do not have a tRNA like structure, but they all they are Paul three driven. They also encode microRNAs, and they accumulate to similar levels okay. in lately infected cells. I don't know if you can answer this, but um, that never stopped me. Um, do we understand why Paul three is driving these as opposed as opposed to Paul two? Uh, no, mm -hmm. I. I mean, uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, it, it it makes sense that that they're driving these because of the tRNA like element at the beginning. Yeah, that yeah. tRNA in and of itself encodes the the Paul three promoter. I see. No, that may be it then. So, so yeah. viruses hijack elements from host cells for their own purposes. What do you think the origin of this uh, 
tRNA is ultimately? Yeah, great question. I mean, I, I don't I don't think we know the answer. There are uh, a few instances of these sorts of things in in host cells and in humans, um, but but they're relatively rare. And there but, are no non-virus type tumors. Um, well, there are some. There are a few microRNAs, for instance, in humans that are transcribed in longer transcripts that are driven by Paul three promoters, um, and, and there are a, some rare instances of tRNA like elements that are upstream of microRNAs in human cells. But that, but again, that's that's it's pretty rare, but it's quite possible that that's where these evolve from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it must be that, or it may be that the Paul three promoter is what drove the evolution. Maybe the, you know, at the mirror genes fused to that at some point and it said, ah, oh, this really works well. We get lots of RNA. <laughs> exactly. Right? Ooh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and exactly. these, these Paul three promoters are internal to this sequence of the gene, right? Yeah, they're not exactly. The they're, okay. Yeah. No, they're, they're embedded within the tRNA like element. Right. So tell us about the uh, epitome, the last experiment. Yeah, <laughs> it's cool. It was actually, it, it was actually a, a an entire series of experiments, but I, we can do it pretty quickly. Which is, you know, the the question that we had, we again hypothesized that based on the results that we had, that this tumor four was important for latency establishment, and that you put the virus in the mouse, it, the virus gets where it needs to get, and it can't establish latency in the cells that it would normally infect. Um, but the other possibility that we really had to check was, is, is it possible that the virus gets in the mouse, but it doesn't actually make it to the sites where we would normally look for latency, all those peripheral sites, secondary lymphoid organs, where we would normally look for establishment of, of latent infection in these B cells. And so to test for this, we uh, Emily went in and infected the mice using a different route of infection, intraperitoneal. So it's essentially bypassing all the mucosal immune responses that you would normally have and, and mucosal dissemination pathways. And instead, injecting the virus in the abdomen or the peritoneal cavity of, of the mouse um, when you do that, the virus can sort of get wherever it wants to. It can easily get into the bloodstream. It can go directly into organs. Um, and if the tumor was in important for establishment of latency in the cells that it gets to, then you would still see a big phenotype. But instead, what Emily saw was that the mutant virus now looked exactly like wild type virus. So there was no phenotype whatsoever indicating that the virus was having trouble getting to those peripheral secondary lymphoid organs rather than having an effect at that organ itself. So I'm just curious about the sequence of the experiment. So did she do the IN, the intranasal experiment first and see the phenotype difference between the mutant and wild type and then do the spleen IP? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. So we do all our infections intranasally and then we saw this and we, we really thought, you know, we, we should check and make sure that it's just not having trouble disseminating mm -hmm. uh, to the peripheral sites. And so that's, yeah, that's why we did that. It's, it's a really dramatic difference. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's amazing. And it's also a tribute to Emily's hands because these are not easy. These are technically very difficult assays to do and, and people that do them will tell you that you get a lot of variability and and she is very very precise uh, and and got these beautiful results from this so it was very clear cut so where it's, is the block going from the mucosa to the spleen right so at that point we knew that it was probably a dissemination phenotype and so emily went back in and did uh, l looked we we figured we might as well start at the beginning, right? You go back and we're doing an intranasal infection. When you do that, uh, at least under anesthesia, uh, you get replication of the virus in the lungs. And so Emily went back and looked in the lungs, and the virus replicated totally normally in the lungs, maybe even a little bit better than wild type virus. Um, after replication in the lungs, the virus uses Philip Stevenson has done some 
beautiful work in a series of papers showing that the the virus probably um, traffics through myeloid cells, dendritic cells, and or macrophages, um, and, and, and probably enters those cells and replicates in those cells, um, and then hijacks or moves along those cells into the tissue draining lymph nodes. In this case, we're talking about the mediastinal lymph node, which is the lung draining lymph node. And so we asked whether the virus was getting to the lung draining lymph node at all. And in fact, it was getting there and it was replicating there. So we knew that the virus replicated normally in the lungs and it got to the lung draining lymph node just fine. Um, and in fact, when she looked at latency establishment in that organ, in, the, in that first draining lymph node, she saw totally normal latency establishment by this mutant. So the virus, the virus was getting there fine and had no phenotype in, in the mediastinal lymph nodes. Everything looked totally normal to that point. And so what we knew at this point was everything was normal up to the mediastinal lymph node, but any of the peripheral places that we looked, including the spleen, we saw this enormous phenotype. And so we figured there might be a bottleneck at this point in the lung draining lymph nodes. Um, and, and the final experiment to really drive that point home was we know uh, through a series of, of, of several different manuscripts, we know that B cells are important for trafficking the virus to peripheral organs. So probably B cells get infected in this first draining lymph node and then traffic the virus around the body and essentially hand it over to those secondary lymphoid organs and allow amplification of those virus at those sites. Um, and so what Emily did in this case was to take the blood uh, at six days post-infection, which is when we know there's virus in the blood, but it hasn't made it to those secondary lymphoid organs yet. And when she did that, she found a that whereas one in 2,600 uh, leukocytes carry the virus in the blood at that time point, that was dropped down to one in 40,000 for the mutant virus. So there was this huge phenotype in the blood indicating that, that probably the virus, uh, those infected cells are having trouble getting out of the mediastinal lymph node and disseminating mm -hmm. to the rest of the body. So the, that's the way that the infection would disseminate. They come out of the nodes, go into the blood and go, say, to the spleen or wherever, right? Yeah, exactly. So exactly. Can, you, can you take those cells and culture and see if they're uh, are they infectable in fact did you do that i don't remember it's it's really hard to get these infected normally mm. in vitro you can pull out primary cells and you can infect them a little bit but a lot of times in culture it's, it's a bit of a lytic infection um every virus is a little bit different but the, for this particular one it's uh i mean while the wild type mhv68 even uh, it's hard to infect those cells in vitro mm. So what are you thinking so, about for what is the uh, the block there in, in trafficking? Well, we we think it could be, uh, I mean, there's a, there's multiple possibilities yeah. and, and we don't have the mechanism nailed down yet. So it's still a, it's a really interesting story, but we do not have the mechanism wrapped up. But, um, you know, I, I'm thinking about it, we are thinking about it as, as though there's really essentially one of two possibilities. One is that we know the B cells in that lymph node are getting infected fine. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just having trouble getting the right signals in order to leave the lymph node. Mm -hmm. B cells, mm -hmm. anytime they leave, lymphoid organs have to get the right signals and upregulate the right receptors to get out of the lymph node. And so maybe they're just not getting the right signals. The other possibility is that the virus, uh, the mutant virus, is killing the B cells that are uh, destined to mm. go circulate the virus. And so maybe there's apoptosis of those infected cells. And we haven't been able to detect that yet, but that's definitely a possibility. I like the first one because it makes perfect sense that a, a viral gene, right, would be involved in per, uh, having the cells get out so that it could spread elsewhere, right? Right, ex exactly. But I think the second one's just as plausible because yeah, you, can, sure. you can imagine that all the other tumors <laughs> are the ones that activate the immune system. Yeah. But the side effect right. would be that it kills the cell. So earlier in the study, you showed that uh, the mutant replicates normally in naive and germinal center B cells, but not memory B cells. Is there a correlation between that observation and this observation uh, regarding spread? Uh, it's 
it's possible that there's a correlation, but we have no no evidence for that direct link whatsoever. Where where do memory B where do memory B cells originate? Well, B, uh, memory B cells would originate in in lymph nodes, but they could originate in this lymph node, or they could originate in any of the other secondary lymphoid organs. Okay. So during B cell differentiation, which would occur in a lymph node before that, once it becomes a memory cell, then it goes into circulation. Okay. Do you know? Uh, I guess you don't know. So let me change the question. Are you trying to find the target for <laughs> Teamer Four? Yeah, absolutely. We we uh, Mehmet Kara, who's in my who's a student in my lab, is now working on trying to identify some of the proteins, for instance, that this Teamer interacts with. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, we don't we don't know the answer yet. But we're certainly pursuing that. So so the you think it might interact with proteins or. It could be silencing some genes as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. It could be silencing genes. Mm. It could be uh, direct action, uh, somehow suppressing the other expression of the other tumors. Yeah. That's possible, uh, although we haven't seen that. Um, it may be a, a, a suppression phenotype like that, or uh, it may be that it's interacting with particular proteins and, and doing something to the cell right. to in- initiate or, or block a signaling cascade. It's a nice story. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so really um, Emily is a PhD student, is that right? Em- Emily uh, graduated this fall, ah. and, and she moved on to Sarah Sawyer's lab at the University of Colorado. Nice. Cool. Yeah. So, so there's a ton of mutants here. Yes. I mean, like, <laughs> uh, these can't be easy to make. They're they're not. They're a lot easier than they used to be. It used to take when I first started my postdoc. It took people, you know, your entire project was spend two or three years making a mutant and then testing it. Um, it's become a lot easier now. So within about two weeks, uh, we can make mutants, and then obviously you have to make the viral stocks. It's not easy to make them. Um, and it's not as fast as I make it sound, but it's a whole lot faster than it used to be. So it was yeah. a, an enormous amount of work, but she's made a, Emily's made a, a, a bunch of important viral reagents. So Rich, I guess you don't go in and talk to Scott anymore, huh? Actually, I do. Yeah. Uh, I have <laughs> discovered over the last couple of weeks, you know, when I first retired, I kind of ran away. <laughs> to the other side of the country as i recall (laughs) but uh i woke up uh, a couple of weeks ago i visited occasionally but i woke up a couple of weeks ago and realized that i really am a science nerd and that i have this fabulous university uh as a resource just a 20 minute bike ride away and my uh colleagues from my uh my uh, active years have been enormously gracious in welcoming me to uh, mm. whatever activities are around, taking people out to dinner, going to journal clubs, and et cetera. So, you know, I'm in a couple of times a week, and uh, I just uh, heard Mamet's uh, talk uh, on his stuff uh, uh, last week, was it, Scott, or the week yep. before? Yeah, it was and, last uh, week. Went to a couple of journal clubs. I'm going in next week to dinner in a couple of journal clubs, and it's grand. Just grand. Uh, just be prepared for the time when you show up and nobody's around. They, they saw well, you or they coming. say, uh, can I help you, sir? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they change the locks. Or the, like with Dixon, they go, oh, no, it's Dixon again. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. <laughs> no, you just, Richard, I understand uh, your enthusiasm because uh, you, it's your life. So yeah, how do you, how do you it, walk away from your life? You don't. I I uh, I'm discovering I'm discovering things all the time. I didn't realize what a nerd I really was. You know. Well, you know, you can say nerd, but you can also <laughs> say you're passionate about learning more about life, and so nerd, that's what you're about. Dixon, I got to tell you, Dixon. Nowadays, nerd is a good word. Nerd's good. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 In your no, days, but, it wasn't. It, uh, you know, where. Just like Twiv, sitting at a journal club, sitting yeah. at a student's uh, research discussion, or something, it's just delightful. You know, sitting there going through the problem with them, going through the process with them. In particular, okay, if it's not your student and not your lab and you don't really have to deal with any of the problems. <laughs> yeah, that's probably – it's like grandkids, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and exactly. I, I have to say we love having Rich around. I mean, you know, sometimes people show up 
these things after they retired, you're like, not that guy, right? You don't want to deal with that yeah, guy. Right, we, yeah. true. we love having Rich around. Yeah. Uh, Dixon, do they love having you here, Dixon? Uh, most, most of the people do. <laughs> yeah. I'd say that everybody does, but uh, I haven't run into any um, hmm. any negative feelings of, with, with regards to my... You let us know. We won't stand uh, You know, that. I still serve on our admissions committee for our medical school and things like this. I haven't given listen. up... They don't activities. actually listen to what you say, though. You know? Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> yeah, they, don't, they just ignore your... That's why I wasn't on TWIV last week. Yeah. I was doing uh, yeah. uh, medical student interviews. How about that? That's great. Yeah. Anything else before we move on, Kathy? Uh, just a reminder that there's also a commentary by Rodney Kincaid and Chris Sullivan right. about this paper also in Msphere and reminding people that Msphere is open access. This episode is also sponsored by Microbe Magazine Podcast, which is produced by the American Society for Microbiology, it's a monthly show hosted by Jeff Fox, who is the current topics and features editor for the magazine. And each podcast coincides with an article in the current issue, which if you are an ASM member, you get mailed to you, and which I understand is also online and will soon be only online, or at least partially only online. Uh, for example, episode eight focuses on making yeast strains to produce lager beers with new fav- flavor notes. You can find Microbe Magazine Podcast on iTunes. Just search for it or go to microbeworld.org slash MMP, Matrix Metalloprotease. That's how I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple of Zika virus-related snippets. Yes. Now, um, who found the New England Journal paper? This is me. Go and ahead. I, I, so uh, first I have to apologize because um, our discussion of this will be very short and unfortunately a little bit incomplete. Um, New England Journal of Medicine sent out the announcement of this thing. It's embargoed. It, the embargo actually lifts um, in 47 minutes. Um, <laughs> so when we finish recording, it'll, it'll all be fine. Um, and it is okay for me to do this, to, to distribute the solicit comment from, from experts. Uh, that's the whole point of embargoes. Uh, unfortunately, they did not release the whole paper under embargo, just a draft abstract. Mm-hmm. So is that I'm typical looking, or atypical? No, that's very atypical. And it's very annoying that they've released just the abstract and they said, we'll re- we hope to release the final paper at 3 p.m. <laughs> now... The embargo lifts at 4 p.m., so this is a really, really short embargo. It makes you wonder why even bother. Um, you think they're still writing the paper? <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> that. They're still editing it. Um, yeah. It definitely sounds it is, it is very, very current. So with that out of the way, um, this is an abstract of a study that was done in Rio, Um and a whole bunch of authors. The uh, first author is uh, Patricia Brasil, and um, senior author is Karen Nielsen Sains, uh, mostly MDs. They are obviously looking at Zika virus and birth defects, and they did this. This is the kind of public health study that we were hoping would be done, mm-hmm. and so I'm very glad to see this has is underway. Um, they enrolled pregnant women who had had a rash. Uh, in the previous five days during their pregnancy, um, and if you if you qualified for this, hey, you've had a rash in the pre- previous five days. They did blood and urine samples and tested them for Zika virus by RT PCR, and then they did they followed them prospectively um, to get clinical and ultrasound data. So they enrolled eighty eight women from September through February. So this is very very current. Um, of the 88, uh, 72 of them tested positive for Zika virus in either the blood or the urine or both. And, um, and the remainder did not. Um, and then they did ultrasounds and they found that, um, they, there were fetal abnormalities in a number of them. And so let's see, they did fetal fetal ultrasound on 42 Zika virus positive women and all the Zika virus negative women. Um, so they, yeah, so and they found fetal abnormalities on ultrasound in 12 out of the 42 Zika positive women and none of the 16 Zika virus negative women. Um, wow. So 12, at, 12 out of 42 12 Zika out positive 42. women. 
So That's not every Zika infected. Right. So 29% yeah. of Zika positive women um, had some kind of adverse finding on the ultrasound and zero of the 16 Zika virus negative women. Now, you know, 16, 12, 12 42, these are small numbers, um, but they're yeah, very clean. It's very, very clean. You don't see any of these problems in the Zika virus negative women. Of course, it's possible that the exposure to Zika virus co-segregates with some other exposure factor, and that's what's causing the problem. But this is this is very, I think, very, it, it looks good. Again, I can't see the paper, only the abstract. Um, it looks good in terms of the, uh, um, in terms of the conclusions um, that... They saw this. The findings they had were some were microcephaly, uh, five of them. Um, fetal deaths in two of them, which is a question that came up in one of our follow-up emails. Are there any miscarriages or fetal deaths? And so, apparently. Um, and then various CNS lesions, abnormal amniotic fluid, um, placental artery flow, this kind of thing. Um Eight of the 42 women who they did ultrasounds on have given birth, and they say in the abstract, the ultrasonographic findings have been confirmed. Mm. Now, I yeah. don't know what that means. Right. I, guess the, the, I don't know if any of those eight were, you know, had the abnormalities. So, <laughs> um, Yeah, right, right. They don't say that here. Yeah. Right, but based on the abstract, uh, this is... I, I think this could be a very compelling paper, and you know, I'm I'm just going to have to have some faith in the New England Journal that they're doing that they did the peer review properly and and that the data back up the conclusions. But well, we can certainly take a look at it next week again after we've ingested the whole thing. But it's right. pretty uh, together with all the other data we've looked at, talked about here on TWIV. This is adding to uh, the, the idea that Zika is involved in these. It is. It is starting to look really. Yeah. Compelling, yes. In a couple of weeks, in a month, actually, we'll have a our friend Esper Callis from Brazil on an infectious disease physician, so he can help us go through all of this. I'm sure there'll be more in the next four weeks. Yes. There's also another paper just out. This is a cell stem cell. Who's who discovered this? I did because and, uh, our PR person sent it to me under embargo for possible comment. Mm. And I sent it to a stem cell person to comment on. Mm, do you have any comments on it? Um, well, it's interesting because uh, at least what the other person here said that it, it seems. So uh, the title of the, the paper came out today in Cell Stem Cell, so everybody can go look at it. Zika virus infects human cortical neural precursors and attenuates their growth. First author is Hengli Tang. Last author is Guo Li Ming. And they're from Florida State, Emory, Johns Hopkins, uh, anyway, several places. And so uh, it seems pretty clear that, at least in these experiments with stem cells, that the Zika virus preferentially infects human neural precursor cells rather than pluripotent stem cells or more mature neurons. And there's some evidence that the infected progenitor cells release viral particles because they take the supernatants and they go on and, and infect Vero cells from that. And so her comment is, you know, if we assume that microcephaly results from either increased cell death, decreased cell proliferation, or inhibition of cell migrations, uh, the data here could be uh, informative because it looks like there's some increased cell death and some changes in the cell cycle. But it's, to my mind, very much in the, on the order of uh, preliminary data. Yes. Uh, it's very hastily written all through it. I'm saying, how'd they do that? Where, what? <laughs> yeah, huh? No. You know, <laughs> but, it was submitted a week ago, basically. Yeah. Right. So, um, anyway, um, there you have that. You know, I... I would prefer a more carefully done. This is clearly rushed out because this is a hot topic, right? Mm -hmm. It's the yes. fault of both the authors and the journal that this is rushed out in a week. I understand the, the, the desire to do this, but there's, as Kathy said, there's so many questions here. I really would like a more complete study because that's going to still have to be done. 
And well, the, you, the you know, even with what they had, if they had, you know, tight reviewers reading it carefully and saying, wait, yeah. what did you inoculate with here? Was that, you know. But, you know, they send it and they say, we need this tomorrow. Right. right? Yeah. And, all right, read it quickly. And the press release that accompanies it, unfortunately, starts off um, with, a, with a whole big load of hype. Uh, yeah. Likely biological link found between Zika virus microcephaly. Mm. Yeah, mm, no. Okay. <laughs> Starts to hint at a possible mechanism, maybe. Yes. <laughs> All right. Any more uh, late minute, uh, last minute Zika papers that we know? Of? <laughs> That's it. That's it. Okay. Uh, we have some email, some of which have to also do with Zika. And the first is from Stephen, who writes Dear Twiv Team. During TWIV 378, it was suggested that viruses may engage in an evolutionary arms race with the blood-brain barrier. I couldn't help thinking that this seemed unlikely because I can't think of a virus for which neuroinvasion in humans or most other hosts isn't a dead end with respect to transmission. Instead, it seems more likely to me that properties of the virus selected for in other compartments or other species incidentally lead to the ability to invade the human CNS. Possibilities could include a requirement to cross endothelial barriers in other contexts, such as to establish viremia or systemic infection, or the ability to replicate in cells that may periodically enter the CNS for purposes of immune surveillance. I'm sure other pressure exists that might select for viruses capable of neuroinvasion, but I'm hand-waving and can't come up with other examples now. Thanks for the continued excellent coverage of Zika and, as always, great papers covering any and all areas of virology except plant viruses. <laughs> well, um, so I think... We were we're not always talking about the CNS. We're talking about the peripheral nervous system as well. And and then of course last week we had Greg Smith who talked about herpes simplex, which goes in and out of the peripheral nervous system, right? So that virus has the ability to go in and out. In terms of the central nervous system, he talked about rabies virus, which can get out of it in dogs, for example, via the saliva. So and then of course polio virus, it's a dead end. And Dixon, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. for West Nile, the CNS invasion would also be a dead end. Yeah, you right? need a heroic mosquito, mosquito <laughs> to get through the brain. So <laughs> I think through. I think for many viruses, you're right that probably other things have selected for the ability to get in. So I would guess for polio, you know, it binds this receptor, which happens to be at the neuromuscular junction. So you know, it might accidentally find itself there as a consequence of needing to bind a receptor, which is also in the gut. Do you consider rabies to be a dead end? Mm -hmm. No, I said it wasn't because it can get out of the okay, dog you did brain, right? It. Right, right. Yeah. Now, in people, but we're not the natural host, right? So that may be, it, may, it didn't evolve in us. It evolved in... You have to talk uh, about bats. To bats, talk about yeah. Normal right. host. So, but it can get out of the CNS, yeah, in other animals too. But if, certainly there, there are two different kinds, viruses that can get out and can't. So I, I, I agree with Stevens. I, I think from the perspective of an infectious agent to infect the wrong host is a uh, unintended consequence of... Uh, Dixon, there are no intentions unexpected. when we talk about viruses. <laughs> things, just, well, things just happen, right? You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> if the right host is infected and it's been evolutionarily in, in a sync with each other for a long time, it's likely that it's not a very pathogenic virus, whether, whether, whereas if it's a new association, you'll, you'll see that. Right, and, and if there's... Uh, I mean, the advantage to getting into the brain is that there's less immuno there is immunological activity in there, contrary to traditional belief. But it is a somewhat protected environment where the virus might have a freer reign. Um, and you know, we just spent a show talking about herpes viruses, which do invade neural tissue and gain some advantages from doing so. Dixon, this idea of long-established infections being less pathogenic—I'm yeah. sorry—not always true. For right. many human, Nothing is not always true. Well, well many <laughs> human virus, <laughs> in fact, smallpox has been with us for many, many hundreds, thousands of years, and it still wipes you out. It's only malaria. 30, it's only thirty percent lethal. Oh come on, that's that's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> only thirty percent. All right, that's enough for you. Malaria is less than. 1%. I'm turning off your mic. I can reach the switch now. <laughs> <laughs> malaria is less than one percent. As for plant viruses. So uh, maybe in general it's gone down, but we don't know. We have no h historical data about that. All we know is that when viruses, for example, first jump from animals into people, they, they can be terribly virulent. Right. And then today we have viruses, which presumably did that a long time ago, yeah. and they're less virulent. But it's not really something we can prove. Right. The virulence is going to – we've talked about 
this aspect before. The virulence will track with what is evolutionarily advantageous to the pathogen. Right. Um, and if it is, if it behooves the pathogen to be less virulent, to hide out uh, and and spread to more hosts, then that's what will happen. But if you have something like a vector-borne disease, um, yep. then it may make sense to replicate to extraordinarily high numbers in the bloodstream and make your host extremely sick, uh, which will not always kill them, but it, it sure could make their lives miserable. Yeah. As for plant viruses, Stephen, we have some. I agree that it's a minority. Yes. And we have done a bunch, but not not a bunch. I would say less than a handful. By the way, do about one percent. One percent. Do we know how bats pass? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me finish my thought, or else I you forget it. Sorry. And then I it will never finished. ever come back. <laughs> um, uh, we have always. All right. Let's let's just say this. Next week we'll do a plant virus paper. How's that? Really. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. Kathy's laughing. She said, well, you're going to forget. Like, sure you that will. If infects plants, then we're right. okay. <laughs> banana wilt virus. I will, let's pick banana wilt virus. Right. So how do bats transmit it between themselves? Transmit what? The rabies virus. I don't know. Nobody knows. I mean, they don't bite each other regularly, do they? they I don't might. know. But we don't know. They, they might, but... They're very social. They have a lot of interaction. They do. They, they do huge colonies. They, they poop all over the floor. They uh, there is new ma- there is a pneumo rabies. I, I know there is. So there's what you can catch it by inhaling it. Right. No. Yes. For people, exactly. this is that, wrong. No, for yes. people that's wrong, but maybe, maybe for bats. bats. How do you know? Oh, for God's sakes, give me a break. I here. don't believe <laughs> you. I don't believe you. Like none of none of us know. So I'm just speculating. Yeah. So. How can you say it's inhaled in bats if we don't know? Because they live. At, I was just following up on what Alan. You're said. speculating. You know what? Of Biology course doesn't I'm care spe- about your hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> I stole that from Scott. <laughs> Should I, did I make a mistake in coming into the show? <laughs> no, I like you, Dixon. It's okay. That's fine. I just want. I, I'm just anticipating getting emails. You know, I'm very sensitive. But I, I, I wondered. Okay, since the, once the rabies virus jumps into an unnatural host, the only way to transmit it is by being bitten by something. A rabid dog, a rabid raccoon, et cetera, et cetera. But in bats, it's a natural parasite. Is it transmitted via the placenta to their offspring? We don't instance? know. We don't know. I know that. Can stop so at, and move on. The reason why, know. wait a minute. The reason why I asked that question. It could even be by inhalation. Somebody out there, <laughs> somebody out there listening knows, and I anticipate getting the answer in the but next show. But we have done episodes on rabies. Why don't you go listen to them? And nobody knows? Go listen to them. Listen from the experts. I did one at... Georgia, Kathy's old place. Yeah, with Jen Fu. Jen Fu, and he talked all about it, and he said the inhalation in humans is baloney. Really? Yeah. Really? So listen to it, but I know you won't because you don't listen to podcasts. <laughs> you only make them. <laughs> Kathy. Back and, on one one thing about the plants. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you really want to check it out, episode 70, episode 92, uh, uh, 202, uh, and 334. Thank for you, sure. Thank there you. may be others. Thank but, you, Kathy. Uh, Can you read Samuel's email, please? Sure. Samuel writes, Howdy, pathogenic partners. Viral varmints. (laughs) Capsid cowpokes. Sheriffs of small infectious particles that replicate inside the living cells of other organisms. Nice. It's an abnormally beautiful, though blustery, 11 degrees C and sunny day in Madison, Wisconsin. I celebrated this freaky February weather evidence of anthropogenic climate change by saddling (laughs) up my steel-framed steed queuing up some back episodes of TWIV on my iPhone earbuds and pedaling along the Badger State Trail towards the Iowa State Line. I listened to episode number 375, Zika and You Will Find, while my bike and I battled a ferocious 17-mile-per-hour headwind blowing from the south. Lord. The insightful, comprehensive, and informative commentary and great perspectives from your guests kept me thinking about flaviviruses and torch pathogens as I fought the wicked wind. <laughs> Clearly, the popular press has made a mess of their Zika reporting, leaving people, my grandparents, for example, confused, frightened, and misinformed. A recent episode of WNYC's On the Media critically analyzed the sensational and sometimes flagrantly inaccurate coverage of the outbreak, and he gives a link to that show. I thought you might enjoy hearing insiders pick apart media swirl and agenda setting around the arbovirus du jour, (laughs) and I heard that on the media, and I agree they they did a nice job. 
I appreciated the variety of viewpoints. A New York Times reporter who reported on Zika while he himself came down with the disease, a Brazilian journalist, a communication spokesperson for the WHO, and Nico Svasilakis of UT Austin. My favorite segment of that episode, though, was the final story, which drew parallels between the current debates about abortion going on in Brazil to the 1964 rubella outbreak in the United States that paved the way for Roe v. Wade. Mm. Thank you all for everything that you do. I only recently added TWIP and TWIV to my slate of science podcasts, although I started listening to TWIM, number 25, in fact, magnetotactic bacteria, during my second rotation as a first-year PhD student at the University of Washington, Seattle. I ended up joining that very lab. Episodes of TWIM got me got me through the innumerable chips and... Uh, chromatin eyepiece, and reversion assays that went into my thesis, which was the consequences of head-on replication transcription conflicts and bacillus subtilis. Now I'm kicking myself for ignoring the rest of the Twix canon. I was bacterially biased as a grad student. My <laughs> reasons for resisting were, who cares about viruses? They're not even alive. <laughs> and parasites? Like worms? I don't want to hear about any cell with a nucleus. Now that I've moved to Madison, Wisconsin, in the midst of a horizontal career transition from researcher to science writer, I've broadened my worldview, or maybe learned to appreciate smaller things, and I'm eagerly working my way through your back catalog. Thanks again. Your podcasts are the pinnacle of science communication. I truly appreciate the insightful questions, charming banter, and deep dedication to inquiry that each of you put into producing top-notch content. The sense of wonder each of you brings to research, listening to Vincent enthusiastically explain gene drives during TWIP 100 was the highlight of my week, is an inspiration for an aspiring science communicator like myself. He cool. really writes well. Yes. Thank yeah, you, Sam. Very nice. And very nice. Thank you for saying that. We are the pinnacle of science communication. Dick Dixon, listen to that. I hear, I hear. This is a podcast. Which <laughs> what, is, what does pinnacle mean? <laughs> you could take a peek at the definition later. <laughs> That's very nice. Uh, very nice of you. I just want to bask in that for a few moments. <laughs> mm. Is there something I uh, wanted to say here? So this is cool that I don't know how many science writers actually listen to to science podcasts, except Alan, but he just he does them, of he course. Makes, right. Now, I also what I found interesting here is that the media is criticizing the media on their reporting. Yes. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, they do that's that every a, week. That is, that is a standard um, thing that the that the media industry does to itself since since it began. Yeah, um, I guess complain I, about how other reporters are not doing their jobs right, <laughs> and that's an important function because yeah, you know sure. it, the watchdog function of the of the press is is one of the things that it does, and and uh, got to keep an eye on ourselves. It's odd. It's not odd though to see it's an NPR based. Yes, system. very NPR. <laughs> Mm. Alan, can you take the next one? From sure. Miriam? Miriam writes, Dear Twivists, I have a query about polio eradication. In a recent episode, Vincent mentioned the destruction of polio laboratory samples as part of, an on, uh, as part of coming to the end of the eradication program. I'm puzzled by this, as you've previously described the problem with ending vaccination, i.e. that the uh, inactivated polio vaccine does not give immunity in the gut and that the oral pol- polio vaccine reverts during passage through the gut meaning that both vaccine-derived and wild-type virus are likely still prevalent and liable to cause disease again should vaccination be suspended. Has a solution to this problem been found, or have I misunderstood the issues? I'm sure Vincent has views on this and would be very interested to hear them. Um, I'm just going to pause there because we certainly do have views on this issue. (laughs) I, I believe the WHO and the CDC have misunderstood the issues, and you've actually hit on a central problem in the idea of stopping polio vaccination. Which I think we have discussed pretty yes. much before as well, right? Yes, this is this is a core issue that is unresolved and is there there's not even a proposal yet that has any credibility. No, what they're gonna do is stop using the type two Sabin vaccine in April next month globally and hopefully there won't be any outbreaks of that type so- two. Yeah. There's no yeah. plan. I mean, they say you should countries should uh, follow up with IPV type two, but they are not doing the They're, same guidance as they have done with the with the OPV program. Right, and and many many countries cannot follow up right. with IPV. They just do. They can't afford that. They don't have the resources or the infrastructure or anything. Right. Um, so as usual, the rich countries are going to be able to protect themselves. The poor countries are not, and. 
who knows what happens. Um, you know, maybe we get lucky and we're able to stop vaccinating against type two and nothing bad happens, or maybe it doesn't go that yeah. way, but it's, it's, I think it's a highly irresponsible, irresponsible approach. All right, so continuing with Miriam's letter. On a different topic, in contrast to, re to a recent correspondent of yours, I find the way you work through topics that are not in your specialism uh, one of the most valuable things about TWIV. Established facts can, facts can be easily gleaned from any textbook, but the process of pulling together known facts to produce viable hypotheses is not so easily learned, and I find your discussions fascinating. Thank you. And Miriam is an undergraduate at the Open University's Natural Sciences Program in the UK. Nice. Interesting. Some people want us to not speculate and get experts, and others kind of like when we find and our some way Some people around. hate the weather reports, and some, some people, people like give them. them. Hey, there's yes. a pattern here, isn't there? Yes, there is. This discussion about whether or not you know we should know the answers to everything uh, <laughs> uh, reminds me of... Uh, 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 a bit I heard on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me the other day, this NPR show that I really love. They had Neil DeGra uh, deGrasse Tyson on, and they gave him one of these silly quizzes where there were three sort of current events related uh, questions, and you know he had to get two of them in order to get a prize, right? Yep. Well, he only got one right. Right, right. <laughs> and at the end of the show, they said, Gee, Neil, I'm, you know, we're really sorry you didn't get more right. And he says, what do you mean? He <laughs> says, if I'd have gotten them all right, I wouldn't have learned anything. I got two wrong. I learned two things. Well, yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I really love that. Rich, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Uh, Yella writes. That's how I interpret this. He says, yeah. it's J-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. He says, pronounce like yellow, but replace the O-W with E as you pronounce it in yellow. Mm -hmm. So that's Yella, I think. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yella writes, Dear Vincent and Twivers, I'm currently preparing a new lecture in which I will lecture about the microbiome and more specifically the virome. During these classes, the students will get a task to listen to one of the Twiv shows and read the paper discussed in that show. Nice. Make a presentation about it and present it to their classmates. Far out. I have <laughs> prepared a list of relevant Twiv shows of which most, not all, deal with the virome or viral metagenomic studies. And wow, there's quite a number of them. 312, yeah. she sells B shells, 313. I'm not going to go through all these. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, and, uh, yeah, and some of them are doubles where we have two virome studies in the same episode. If you want to see all these, we do post all these emails. Hey, there's a plant virus one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I do recall a show where you discuss the following paper, and he gives a link to a paper or a, a reference to a paper. However, I could not find the correct TWIV number. Can you help me out? Would you have any other good suggestions for TWIV shows related to virome slash viral metagenomic studies? Thank you very much in advance. Yella. PS1. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be organizing a 13th International Double-Stranded RNA Virus Symposium in the fall of 2018, most likely in Belgium. I would love to have a live TWIV show there. As soon as I have the final dates, I'll send you an invitation. Nice. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, PS number two, eight degrees. C in Leuven, uh, Belgium, with scattered clouds and a cold 29 kilometers per hour wind Burr. from the southeast. Burr. So, um, uh, some of you guys found some more here. Yeah, Kathy and got? I found this pathogenic SIV infection associated with an expansion of the enteric virome. That was TWIV 204, which I found by the new search box on TWIV, and Kathy found in her syllabus. <laughs> it's one of the ones that I offer students the possibility to read and and write a paper on. Actually, I did in the past. I keep updating it because I, I like I, I get tired of reading ten papers about the same paper, and I want to <laughs> refresh my memory about other twibs. <laughs> but anyway, this is another. Uh, this is paper from Skip Virgin's lab. That's right. Right now, I think uh, Yella has covered most of them here. I was thinking of the. Um, Steve Elledge approach looking for antibodies. I think that must be got viruses, right? Something like that, or got to catch them all. And then we had the Lipkin one, 
That's right. one of those two. I, I think those are all of the virome ones we've done. Is the baby one? Yeah, baby's yep. first virome. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Public epitope. That's the that must be the elegy one. Yeah. <laughs> but I tell you, out of all these titles with viruses like these, who needs enemas? <laughs> it's just just <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Alan Dove, for your you're quite welcome. Talents. I can't imagine when when you're gone what we're going to do. <laughs> I'm sticking around, but I'll be gone before you, so you got to figure that out. Ooh. I'll have to figure out that audio panel too. Um, right. <laughs> when you see a picture of it, it's incredible. Oh, I did. He t- he texted oh. us a picture at the beginning. It's, it it looks right. like the beginning of the telephone era. Dixon, it looks looks like he's going to yes. launch a missile or something. I'm not going to let you read this next one, but you will right. read the last one because this next one is very difficult. Oh, thanks a lot. Rich was going to work on this. Yeah, yeah well, I, I kind of, I kind of did. Looks like Rich. there's been some more comments in here. Right, a lot of people. Have. So this is from Connie, who's right, Southwest Alberta, Canada, four degrees Celsius, no wind. <sighs> I am a retired animal health lab tech. The camelid quote have to have unquote tidal wave happened some twenty plus years ago. In the lab, I did blood separation for IgG lacking crea. More in llamas than in alpacas. We shear fiber animals now and have found through the years that females producing IgG lacking young would produce this same problem over and over. We also see sour mouth orf, sheep and goat disease as a chronic disease in camelids. More in surf, suri alpacas, crossbred. I've also seen one whole herd that was dealing with bovine viral diarrhea virus in the herd to the point the herd was sold really looked like a carrier in the herd as other than the acute animals, the rest of the herd was healthy and cattle were not in the immediate area. Listening to your Zika talk made me throw together all this and think the camelids came down out of high plains without mosquitoes to mosquito-infested areas of South America. With what I have seen as low or no antibody response to so many viruses, could this have been missed? a missed link to this virus? Mm. In the lab, I saw no virus isolation done on any of the cases we got except the BVD herd. The, quote, that could not be the case, unquote, really rings in my mind. Connie, okay. P.S. Newbie to your TWIV podcast and just loving it. <laughs> I, I actually was unaware that there was a, a llama craze, um, but Kathy has just confirmed that there was. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. Llamas became the thing to have. I recall somehow. I, yeah. I know there's there are a lot of llama farms locally um, or yeah. locally, I, I, but um, <laughs> I, I'm not I, sure. I, as pets. Was, I, I think I think as as farm as like, farm. Like, yeah, yeah, I, th- I thought so that I think, was just sort of a hip rural Western Massachusetts Northampton thing to do. Was uh, yeah, we raise llamas, um, but uh, so there was there was actually a a fad of llama farming, I guess. Right, and then she mentions. Sour mouth orf. Well, and before when we I get put, to that, oh, the IgG I, lacking crea. Now, the, I think that's I think that's IgG dash lacking crea. Yes, these right. Are, so these are these are baby llamas that don't have IgG. That's what it says, apparently. But uh, I, I don't quite understand that. That uh, yeah, I don't. I don't get that. They are single chain, though, right? Yeah, they, that's what I was just thinking too. Yeah. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Yeah. Anyway, so crea is the word for young of camelids, right. and huh. so then they shear fiber animals, and they found through the years that female females that produce IgG lacking young would have the same problem over and over. Hmm. And then she says we also see sour mouth orf, which I put into Google, and it said something like, "Do you really mean?" <laughs> sore mouth, <laughs> right? And and uh, so it's sore mouth infection, and ORF is a pox virus, which Rich must know something about. Oh ORF yeah, virus. ORF is or, or, no yeah, open ORF. reading frame. <laughs> <laughs> no, ORF's a big deal in uh, in sheep mostly in uh-huh. uh, in Australia and uh, New Zealand and around. It's uh, well, well, what it's I want to know is how do they know the sheep mouth is sour? <laughs> it's sore. It's oh, not sore. sour. Okay. <laughs> sore mouth. I mean, it might be one of those uh, linguistic things where yeah, yeah, the yeah. phrase has morphed as well. Right. I hear that all the time on the other podcast I listen to, but yes. And I, then, so there was a whole herd with bovine viral diarrhea and they sold it? Boy, Before yeah, they boy. died. 
<laughs> was the was the they're buyer not stupid. A bit they're upset not stupid. When they got home with a truckload of llamas well. that had the runs. I <laughs> yeah, apparently. Yeah. But what the whole point of this is that she's thinking about um viral diseases with reference to Zika and then she gets into this riff where the camelids came down out of the high, out of the high plains without mosquitoes to mosquito infested areas and I guess the implication is there could that have become mosquito transmitted and is this something that happened with Zika but we you know this is a good question all we know that is in the Zika forest that first sentinel monkey did get infected by probably a mosquito was sitting up in a cage that had bitten something else so I think in the, in the in the wild that this virus is transmitted that way, although we just don't know. Right, and if, and of course the llamas um, arose in the New World and have lived in the high plains of the Andes for as long as they've been a species. Um, mm -hmm. So the whole ecosystem there in modern times yeah. is new to the to the biology of them. Uh, but so, so maybe that's you, you introduce Zika to a new population that's in, in you know immunologically naive, and it's just same sort of thing has happened to the camel itself. But has there... Well, okay, yeah. It's, and uh, just the connection with BVD, I was curious as to whether bovine diarrheal virus is actually an issue for camelids. And in fact, it's a newly recognized serious health problem yeah. for alpacas. Interesting. Serious problem in cattle has now been proven to also cause illness, abortions, and most important of all, the persistently infected state in alpacas. Cool. The, produ the ability to produce persistently infected crea um, is really important for the alpaca industry. So I guess, you know, the point here is that she's seeing emerging infections in the alpacas once, right. the, once they moved. She's thinking about mosquitoes in this regard, though most of these diseases that she's talking about I don't think are uh, c uh, transmitted by or are arthropod-borne. In particular, uh, ORF, I know that's, that's not. Right, yeah. okay. All right, last one, Dixon. Oh, did did we say <laughs> that she's a new listener? Yeah, she's a newbie to the podcast and just loving it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Welcome. Ken well, writes, "Hi, Twiv Stirs. I have a relative who spent the summer of 2001 camping in national parks in Uganda. A couple of years later, he began having tingling feelings in his hands, which was suspected to be Guillain-Barré syndrome (GBS) and eventually diagnosed as chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, or CIDP, the chronic form of GBS. With the news of Zika and GBS, he asked the neurologist this week if it made sense to test for Zika antibodies. The neurologist said, rightly, that there is no reason to test since it won't change the diagnosis or treatment at this point. But my relative is now curious, and the thought that there may be a study that he could volunteer to participate in based on his history. Do any of you know of any such work currently being done that needs subjects? Thanks, Ken. He's from Snohomish, Washington. <laughs> Snohomish is a fabulous place because there's a wonderful salmon river that runs right through it, and there's a salmon fly named after it. So I, I love that area. I've spent some time there. So, Ken, you live in a great place. Where the weather equals Seattle winter. <laughs> exactly. All right. So if anyone knows of any studies that uh, yeah. Ken's relative might participate in, it sounds like he just wants to get uh, serum checked for antibodies. It sounds like if you send it to the CDC through your local physician, they will Well, the physician doesn't want to do it. Well, I, I would persist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's one way to do it. All right, let's do some picks. I don't know if you have a pick, Scott, but we can let you wait to the end if you want to think about one. <laughs> I have one. All right, very Excellent. good. Since you got it, let's start with you. All right. The final issue, final 2015 issue of Nature, uh, they did a 365 best images of 2015. And uh, particularly on the web, there's some images that were not in print. And of course, there's a, some beautiful microscopic images and images of space, but there are some real hidden gems in there, including the uh, African carcass cam, <laughs> demonstra oh. demonstrating the daily life of vultures. Oh my gosh. And, nice. and a, a beautiful photographic image of a French farmer standing in his underwear 
fighting members of a bird protection society off with a shovel. <laughs> wow. I point my shovel in your general direction. <laughs> That's funny. Cool. I'm a, I, I didn't know that one. That's great. Love That's it. Great. Hey, hey, Scott, do you play golf, by the way? Uh, rarely. Uh, so you're not part of the uh, pox virus invitational down there. <laughs> no, I'm banned. <laughs> <laughs> you're not banned. Listen, all you got to do is get vaccinated and you can join us. <laughs> Rich, as a very, very small a side note, did you see that Tiger Woods was present for that uh, teenager tournament? The kid took a swing. It was his first golf game and he nailed a hole in one. Ooh. It was on the internet. Uh. It was just happened about three days ago. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Sure. Alan, what do you have? I have um, something that just started. I had this in my RSS feed waiting for them to get on site. Um, this this is a site with live updates from a research ship called the Okeanos Explorer, which is now going through the, um, uh, the protected area, huge protected area of uh, reefs and deep water of, off the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and uh, I think the mission is called Hohonu Moana. Um, and they're doing these, these deep water um, rover dives and exploring this whole area. And they've, uh, I think on day one, they already discovered a new species of deep water octopus. Mm. Cool. Which is so uh, cute. It's <laughs> adorable. Wow. It's this, this little, of course, Aww. it's totally pale white because uh, <laughs> it lives in total darkness. And, and it's just kind of, hanging out there on the bottom and there's a video of it uh, and if you watch the video that you can hear the background audio is the um the communication channel um for the research team and they're they're saying well what is this and well, we don't know or what's not in any of our guides and some people are gonna be very excited about this nice, nice. that's cool yeah so very a nice. lot of fun very nice <laughs> rich condit okay i uh ah. have this app that i'm sorry folks but this is for iphone people only as far as i know i have an app called go iss watch mm. international space station tracking so i've been using this for a couple of years now and uh it uh basically tracks the international space station and tells you when it's going to be passing over uh, in a configuration where you can see it which is usually either just before um uh, just early evening or early morning. So uh, the deal is it's got to be when it's dark, of course, so you can see it, but also when the sun is close enough to the horizon so that it bounces off the space station and, re and reflects it so that you have some light. And uh, if you've never watched the space station go over, it's really fun. Uh, so this thing will set off an alarm. It'll tell you where to look. It'll tell you how high on the horizon it is. It's got a bunch of different ways to uh, track it, but mostly it tells you where to look, and then you just go out there and watch this thing pass over. It's awesome. Nice. Uh, there are, um, you know, equivalent um, apps, I think, for Androids and stuff that you can get to, to do this. But if you've never watched the space station go over, it's worth worth doing. Yes, you can actually. Yeah, yeah. There, are, there are several apps for um, satellite tracking that'll include the ISS. Yes. Yep. Rich, when I was a kid in the 1950s, we saw Sputnik going overhead. Ooh. Ah. Remember, they said on the news, Sputnik's coming over New Jersey right now, and we went outside and saw this thing moving across the sky. It was very I kind of, I kind of vaguely remember uh, trying that and being unsuccessful, but. Cool. You were in Florida, right? No, you weren't in Florida. Uh, no, I was a kid. I was in California. California. <laughs> yeah, well, it didn't pass over there. <laughs> it stayed away from California. Kathy, what do you have? <laughs> I picked space travel posters. Uh, a couple of weeks ago on the uh, astronomy photo of the day page, they had one that was really cool. Uh, relax on Kepler 16b, <laughs> where there are... Uh, the land of two suns where your shadow always has company. And then uh, I followed the link on that to uh, a page of additional posters, which I'm not able to get back to at the moment. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, JPL NASA posters. And there's uh, Mars, Jupiter, Earth, Ceres, Titan, uh, Kepler 186F. And, and, 
they're just really cool and i thought people would enjoy looking beautiful. at them beautiful art Very nice. gorgeous. Yeah. and with yeah. one one click you can get them all downloaded 641 megabytes it's cool <laughs> so it takes a while it kind of comes that. as a um you know uh zip condense a zip yeah and they're all in this uh this sort of 1930s travel poster yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Yep. cruise line yep. yep i like it it was always redder on the other side <laughs> it's just so cool really cool dixon what do you have well i found an amazing video it's almost 14 minutes long and it's a recreation of ancient rome and it's a tour of that city uh, and I think it was like uh, 200 AD. It was, it was representative of what the city was like in 200 AD. 320. 320. Sorry, 320. I, I was amazed at how much past AD the city was before it hit its peak. That's the, the narrator actually says that Rome was at its peak at this particular time. At any rate, it's a um, all uh, computer generated image uh, recreation. But it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. I, st- I started to watch it, but I didn't have enough time before the show. And what I saw so far is really cool. Yeah. It is neat. Yeah. I recognize this long building. <laughs> that is the uh, chariot race. Yeah, right, right. Area. I remember seeing the ru- ru- ruins of that. What is the it's, name of that again? It's near the Colosseum. Yeah, it's got another name. I guess. It has another name. I can't remember it. Chariot race building. <laughs> Rome. <laughs> chariot race building. It's called the... Um, Something on on. No, the, here it is. Roman chariot racing. Uh, it's got a name. Circus Maximus. That's the one. Circus. Look at that. Did you find that on Yahoo News? No, I, I found that <laughs> uh, on Wikipedia. No, I didn't actually. I found it on some obscure website. Uh, my pick of the week is the Twitter missing manual. <clears throat> there are lots of things that you can do on Twitter that most people don't know about, and this has them all. And this is um, good. the most important one that all of you need to know is if you're going to write a tweet to someone, if I go at Alan Dove, hey, did you see this? Only he will see it. So if you put a period in front of it or any text, it's easy just to hit a period in that Alan Dove. Then it goes into everyone's stream. Um, huh. And there are lots of little things like that, which you don't need to read, Dixon, because you don't tweet. It's and true. I, know, I do not. And you don't appreciate the value. But this that's goes okay. on there, for a There are two time. imposters tweeting for you, Dixon. <laughs> There are, and they. We I have, think that's true, by the way. And we have it, conversations. I can't yes. believe that somebody tweets on your behalf, and <laughs> yeah, and Alan and I typically have conversations with him, and uh, he you said like him once, better than uh, me. I know, I know. He uh, said one point. I found it on Yahoo News because he knows that that's your source for news. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I don't look, look at Fox News. <laughs> yeah, maybe right. fake Dixon is not a he. Maybe it's a she. It could Ooh, be. That's right. Well could big. be. Well yeah. Why do we assume? Because uh, we figure it's a gender match, but it might not be Dixon. Gender. Maybe reminds Dixon. me of that. Reminds me of that New York New Yorker cartoon for a long time ago with a with a dog mm-hmm. up uh, looking at a keyboard and a, uh, and, uh, and a computer screen. He's talking to another dog. And he says, "On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog." That's right. That's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fabulous poster. <laughs> Uh, we have a listener pick from Peter. Hi, Twiv team. A short nine-minute program from the BBC World Service on the broken market for antibiotics. It's a life and death. This is a quote from the description. It's a life and death situation. The world is at its last line of defense against some pretty nasty bacteria, and there are no new antibiotics. But it is not the science that's the big problem. It is the economics Despite the $40 billion market worldwide, there's no money to be made in antibiotics, so big pharma have all but stopped their research. Why is this, and how do we entice them back in? Wesley Stevenson finds out. Okay, Wesley. You know Wesley Dixon? I don't, but I'm glad he's out there, because that's absolutely essential for the future of humanity. All right, thank you, Peter. That will do it for TWIV379. And by the way, I don't know if anyone is really interested in this uh, little fact, but, you know, we're, we're marching towards number 400, which by my calculations should happen on the 29th of July wow. of this year, uh, more or less. So sometime at the end of July. 
beginning of August, Dixon. I'll what do you here. think about that? The I, podcast that you thought was going nowhere. I never said that. It was a waste <laughs> you know, of time. You know, you're putting, that's the other Dixon on the other tweeting that said that, not me. You and can, it's a woman. You're right. It's a woman. <laughs> <laughs> you can find us at microbe.tv slash twiv and also on iTunes. And do send us your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. Scott Tibbetts, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you had a good time. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Scott is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And uh, right now, that's not where Rich Condit is. He's somewhere else in Florida. But thank you, Rich Condit. Sure enough. Always a good time. Professor time. Emeritus, who apparently is still wor- welcome in his old department. Uh, isn't that wonderful? It is just great. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, everybody. This was a lot of fun, and I learned some things, too. How many things did you learn, do you think? Two? Oh, more than two. <laughs> Definitely more than two. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com and also is on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. Dixon de Pommier, we come to you at the end. Dixon can be found... He is the professor emeritus here at Columbia University, and you can find him at verticalfarm.com and trichinella.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Be nice to Dixon, okay? That's right. And remember, Caleb is listening. <laughs> I'm Vincent Rackin Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. We've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>